food cannot describe you in any other way than a table in the sky. She did not deserve to perish at your hands in the way that she did. Your cold-heartedness towards the deceased is evident from your conduct after you killed her. In sentencing you, the intention is not only to punish you for what you had done, but also to serve as a warning to others that this type of conduct, and I'm stressing abuse, abuse of conduct toward women, will not be tolerated in our society. Hi everyone and welcome back to today's case. Last week we spoke about a taxi ride from Hull and if you haven't seen that I will link it up here for you. Today we're going to talk about the case of Karaba McKenna and if you have not heard about this case then you are in the right place. But this is a case that definitely shook South Africa for a good couple weeks and it was horrific to hear the outcome of this case. Sadly this is not the first case of its kind and it will not be the last. But if you would like to hear what happened to Karaba then let's get in. Intended for mature audiences only. Karaba McKenna was born on the 27th of March 1995 in South Africa. She had a mom named Lorraine and her dad's name was Tsepo. She was the middle child and had a younger brother and an older sister. They grew up in Deepkloof, which is in Soweto, and she stayed there for most of her life. Karaba was said to be an incredibly smart, beautiful, talented and very driven young lady. Karaba was also said to be very wise beyond her years. She had dreams, she had goals that were years in the making, but she knew exactly what she wanted right now. Karaba matriculated in 2014 and then she went on to study a degree in business studies. Karaba did this part-time because in her other spare time she was constantly trying to grow and constantly trying to improve herself in different types of ways. Like I said, Karaba was a dreamer. She was constantly looking how to impact people in the most positive way that she can. She was not only standing on the outside but a beautiful soul on the inside. So like I said, Karaba was a part-time business student and what she would do with the other half of her time is she would volunteer at women's shelters or where people would go through a lot of traumatic events. She would really want to talk to them, try and see how any way that she could help them and especially with women who were abused in any way, she really wanted to go to these specific shelters just to try and talk to them and just make them feel better any way that she could. Karaba had very big dreams of opening her own non-profit organization so that she could help women to be strong and independent in any way that she could as well. So in October of 2016, while Karaba was busy studying and while she was also volunteering a lot of her time part-time to shelters, she was around 20, 21 years old at the time and she then met a 27-year-old man named Sandile Manswe. So let's give a little bit of backstory about Sandile Manswe. Some sources say that Sandile was a married man. He was just separated from his wife at the time. They were going through a very rough relationship and they were just separated and living their own lives like that. But some other sources say that he is divorced and he was completely free to date whoever he wanted to. But basically Sandile was married and he had three children who were incredibly young. So they were all under four years old and they were born quite close together. Sandile was a graphic designer and he did have a degree in graphics design and Sandile did work with a lot of companies within this field. However, he kept job hopping and this may be because he wasn't happy with the particular jobs and the environment or he was just unhappy with graphics design itself, the actual topic of graphics design. So when Sandile met Karabo, he was no longer working as a graphics designer. He was now working as a forex trader and Humble, I wouldn't say, is Sandile's best characteristic because he was out there flashing his money. He was showing Instagram photos with his watch like right up in the camera, so you definitely wouldn't miss it. He was also showing pictures of flashy BMWs, flashy Mercedes, all brand new, and how he would drive them and just his lavish lifestyle in general. Sandile was also always wearing the best suits. You would never see him in like normal clothes. And Sandile would often bring up to Carabo that he was earning about a hundred thousand rand every month, give or take. So very flashy, very lavish lifestyle. Sandile lived in Sand and Sky Apartments and this is where he would do most of his training apparently. Sandile was also said to be an incredibly God-fearing man and he would often volunteer at his church. I'm not sure if he was in the choir but he was involved somehow like that in his church. And Sandile was often very outspoken with Karabo as well about his religion. And not only would Sandile be successful in his forex training and not only would he be raking in the money like that, but he would also offer his services for around 
6,000 Rand to 8,000 Rand a time for him to give you some advice in Forex trading. So this six to eight grand would just be maybe like an hour Zoom call or something. I don't know if they had Zoom back then, but like that kind of thing where he would just speak to you about it and then be like, okay, cool, that's eight grand, thanks. Sandile would also show his very mad skills of Forex trading on YouTube. What up guys, it's Sandile here again. Um, yeah, man, uh, this week is gonna be a big week in trading. There's a whole lot of news that are coming up. But just a tip, man, to everyone who wants to be a trader or is a trader. The truth is, is that 90% of your trading has to do with your mindset. You know, when you trade, it's all about your mindset. It's not really about the mechanics at the end of the day. So all is looking great for Karabo. She is independent. She is successful in her own right. She's stunning and she's just incredibly driven. And now she's met a seemingly very successful man named Sandile, and they now are dating in around October, November of 2016. So around two months after they first started dating, Karabo actually moved into the Santan apartments with Sandile, and all seemed well, but we know often that things happen behind closed doors. Because Sandile was often quite busy with his forex trading, Karaba would go out to brunch or lunch with her friends and she would socialize with her friends that way. And they would talk about things naturally. But one of these brunches or lunches, she actually brought up to her friends that Sandile was not as perfect as he seemed. And sometimes he would be quite aggressive with her. He would often just shout at her randomly or he would throw things at her face. But because Karaba was incredibly in love with Sandile, she did brush it off, sadly. And she just thought maybe he would get better, maybe it was something that she did, and she kept trying to maybe just make the peace and make Sandile happy as much as she could. So to the outside world, Karabo and Sandile were showing a perfect life. They were showing to social media and everywhere else that they were very happy, but things were escalating incredibly bad behind closed doors. Some sources that knew Karabo very closely would say that their relationship was very tumultuous. They were often fighting more than they were even just chilling and talking to each other. It was fighting or nothing. But Christmas of 2016 came and went. They spent Christmas with their families and it was a very happy day for them. Karaba and Sandile spent New Year's Eve together as well and things were looking slightly up for the couple. Now, I remember I said that Karaba was born on the 27th of March. So naturally, 2017 rolled along and the months were starting to go and it was getting closer to Karaba's birthday. And for some reason, in February of 2017, the violence between Sandile and Karaba really started to escalate. Karaba started sending voice notes of things that Sandile would do, how he would just rage in the house. She would send photos around to her friends of what he had done to her, the bruises, the cuts, etc., like things like that. And now her friends were telling her, like, Karaba, you need to leave. You can't stay there. And this is getting ridiculous now. And Karaba was like, she understands, she knows what's happening. However, she just feels that she can't leave. She loves him so much and she just feels that he will change eventually. Like I said, this all happened in around February of 2017. Now we're heading into March of 2017. And now we are at Karaba's actual birthday of the 27th of March. So Karaba's mom wakes up, Lorraine. She then picks up her cell phone and she dials Karaba's cell phone. No answer. So Lorraine's like, okay, maybe they just went out for breakfast. I don't know. I'll call again later. So Lorraine calls Carabo again. No answer. Then eventually she gets a call from Carabo, who is actually in a hospital. And just by the way, remember I said that Sandile and Carabo would often post on social media. They were both very, very in tune with their social media and they were often posting a lot. But from February of 2017, Carabo kind of almost stopped posting on social media completely. She was very silent in that way and her friends and parents thought this was very weird, but they thought maybe it was just because of a fight they had gotten into and it was just something that the couple needed to work out together, but just keep that in mind. So when it happened to be Karabo's birthday and Lorraine was looking through social media, she obviously noticed that there were no posts going about at all and she knew that something was wrong. So when she got a call from Karabo in the hospital, this just sent red flags going and Karabo's brother and sister now headed to the hospital while the mom was kind of still trying to talk Karabo through it and just ask what was actually happening. So while Karabo's siblings were on the way to the hospital, Lorraine was talking to her and she just wanted to get the answers of what happened to her and why she was there. And Karabo said that because Sandile and her had a fight the night before, he decided that he was going to rage 
and take it out on her face. But basically, just to explain what happened is that he, like I said, just raged on the one side of her face. She had an incredibly bloodshot eye. And I mean, this looked like someone had poured dye into her hair. That's how red the eye was. She also had bruises all down her leg, all down her torso. And she just looked in a really, really bad way. Her mom then said to her on the phone, you need to leave, he's going to kill you and you need to get out of that relationship right away. And then they kind of had another discussion and then they hung up and Lorraine headed off to the hospital to see Carago with her siblings. Edward got, uh, got a call from her. She said she's in hospital, morning inside for hospital. She was bitten. I said, but why, Carago, why? And Mama Sandile just threw me here in hospital, left me with the cut. Her brother then gets to the hospital and he sees what Karaba looks like and he says to her, actually no, you need to go to the police station today or whenever you get out and you need to file a restraining order. So there was a lot of like hooing and hawing from Karaba and she was like, but I don't really want to, it's just going to escalate things. And her brother was like, no, I don't care, you're going to go to the police station. So eventually Karaba was like, okay, fine, I will. As soon as I get out, I'll go to the police station, which she did. So Karaba gets out about a day later or so. And she heads down to the police station with her brother, I think, or his sister. She heads down to the police station with somebody. And she walks up to the stairs, she gets to the counter where you can lay your claim. And she then starts talking to the police officer on duty. And she's explaining her story and then they get to filing the paperwork and she writes down the person who she's filing a restraining order on. And she writes down Sandile's name. And the officer like looks at this and he's like, but you can't file a restraining order against him because... He just filed a restraining order against you. Sandile went to the police station while she was in hospital on her birthday, walked down there and filed a restraining order against her because he said that she was the abuser and that she was the one who was throwing things at him and he was just innocent in this entire scenario. There was some information on the internet where Carabo said to one of her friends in a voice note that the reason that he was actually able to lay a claim at the police station was because he went out or he went clubbing and he fell or something like that and he had bruises on his legs and on his arms and he showed the police and he was like, see, I told you, look what she did. And because they had got into a fight one day, so Carabo and Sandile, he actually threw her against the bonnet of their car and it dented the bonnet. And then he also showed police, you see what she did, she's smashing my car. So it was things like this that the police actually ended up believing. So after Carabo ended up in hospital, she was done with Sandile. She left the house, remember they were staying together. She left and she ended up going back to her mom's house. And then around two weeks after this, she was starting to recover, she was starting to get stronger. And her friends were like, let's go out, let's celebrate you growing and getting stronger and just being healthy. And Karaba was like, okay, cool. I'm ready to go out. I feel better. Let's just go party and let's just forget about all of this. So Karaba and her friends head out to a club. They're having a good old time. And Karaba's like drinking and she starts panning the, the club and she sees Sandile. And Karabo's stomach literally falls to the ground. That's how nervous she was. She then immediately picks up her phone and she calls her mom. Her mom then says, get out of there now. This is not going to end well. Come home and we'll protect you. So Karabo's like, okay, cool. She then heads up towards the door. And before she can get out of the door, Sandile intercepts her. And I don't know what type of charm this man has. I don't know what sort of magic he puts on Karabo. But they eventually started to work things out and she felt kind of bad and they started to now kind of pick up dating again from that night on. Now understandably, Lorraine, Karabo's mom, was not happy about this at all. Every chance she got, she would remind Karabo, you cannot date this guy, he's going to end up killing you, stop talking to him. But Karabo kept like brushing off, she's like, oh, mom is changing, he's improving, look what he's doing, he's sending me flowers, he's sending me gifts, he's really trying. And Karabo's mom kept trying to put, she was not having it, but remember, Karaba was now staying with her parents. She was no longer living with Sandile. But Karaba would often go to Sandile's flat. Then, around a month after Karaba's birthday and the whole hospital incident, so this was now the 26th of April, 2017, Karaba and Sandile decided to go out on a date and they were just going to have a good night. And then Karaba was going to stay over at Sandile's house because they were only going to be there really late. So Lorraine, against all of her might, tried to stop this. But Karaba was like, Mom, you know, I'm over 20. Just stop telling me what to do. And they went out for the night. Then Lorraine was like, fine. And 
Lorraine made sure that she called Carabo the next morning. So Lorraine ended up calling Carabo the morning, but she didn't answer. So then Lorraine ends up calling Carabo again at around 11, between 11 and 1. And she's calling her and then Carabo does pick up. And this is on the 27th of April. And she picks up, but she's whispering the whole time to her mom. And she's like, Mom, I can't talk right now. I actually need to go. And she hangs up and she says that she'll call her mom later. Lorraine then tries to call Carabo again later that night, but there's no answer. She then leaves it and then she calls again on the 28th of April 2017 and there's still no answer. And now Lorraine starts to get panicky and she goes into protective mode. She then leaves her house and goes to all of Carabo's friends and starts asking where she is, do you know where she is, any information that she can get. Carabo's friends did say that they saw Carabo and Sandile clubbing again on the 27th of April. But after that, they have no idea where she is. So Lorraine eventually gets fed up with not having any information about Carabo and she calls Sandile. And Sandile picks up and he's like, what? Where's Carabo? I don't know. I have no idea where she is. She stormed off. She left. She was all upset and I have no idea where she is. So Lorraine was not happy with this excuse. She felt very uncomfortable with how Sandile handled the whole situation. And while she was at the Santon Flats, she asked the staff around the area to just keep an eye out for Carabo and she put a picture up of Carabo she showed them and they had now had a picture of her in their mind and she also asked if they could find anything of, of hers like lying around please give it back to Lorraine. So the next day which is now the 29th of April the staff at the Santon Flats they do call Lorraine because they said that they actually found some of Carabo's stuff. They said that they found her passport or her ID and they found some of her banking cards. So Lorraine rushes to Santa Flat and she collects the stuff and then the next day she goes to the police station which is the 30th of April 2017. When Lorraine gets to the police station she files a missing persons report of Carabo McKenna. All of Carabo's friends hit the ground running. They were incredibly worried about their friend. They posted everywhere on social media, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. Her face was everywhere in South Africa and everyone was trying to look for her. So now that Lorraine has filed a missing persons report for Le Carabo, the police then head with Lorraine to the Santon Flats and they then ask like the concierge where's Sandile. And they say, oh, it's not here. And then Lorraine calls Sandile and she's like, where are you? When are you coming back? So Sandile says, oh, he's busy. He'll come back there at like nine o'clock at night. So Lorraine's like, okay, cool. I'll sit here and I'll wait. And the police and Lorraine actually waited at the flats for Sandile. And he then rocks up like almost 10 o'clock at night. But he did eventually come back. And he then sees Lorraine and the cops. And Lorraine asks, what happened to Carabo? Her stuff is here. Where is she? While the police are waiting for Sandile, they did ask for the CCTV footage of the like entrance area of the flat and they did happen to get it. So Sandile rocks up and police are very, very suspicious of him. They take him into custody because they just want to ask him some questions and they then take Sandile to the police station where they can question him. About three officers go into an interrogation room and they're all just asking him questions. Lorraine refuses to leave the police station. She sits there the entire night and sits in the waiting room and just waits for someone to come back to her or any information about her daughter. Then, around an hour later, a female officer leaves the interrogation room and she walks towards Lorraine and she sits down next to her, she takes off her hat and she just looks at Lorraine and says, I'm so sorry to tell you, but Carabo is not coming back. So Sandile basically said that he left the flat because they were fighting and when he came back that Carabo was already lying on the bed and he went to touch her and she was cold and he panicked and he said that he then bundled her body up and he left the flat and then he dumped her body in like a grassy area, poured pool acid over her body and then lit the match, flicked it on her and then left. The police were shocked by this confession. They then picked Sandile up, grabbed him and they told him, okay, you said you dumped the body there. Let's go find her. So they then ask Sandile to show them where he said that they left the body. They then get to this grassy patch, which was in the Bromley or Bramley area. And then there was nothing there when they got there. Now this irritated police quite a bit, but I'm sure that Sandile was quite relieved. And because they had no body, they just had superficial, basically, evidence of this whole case. And they had Sandile's flimsy confession. There was nothing to hold Sandile on and he was then let go. He was then released back into normal society and he carried on like nothing happened. So while the family of Caraba was busy mourning her passing, Sandile was having a great old time. He was on Instagram still flashing his money. He was now showing that all these other women that he had in his life of all the expensive gifts that he could give them. He was actually buying other women gifts in this time and he was just 
living life up, basically. Then around 10 days after Sandile confessed to Karabo's passing, things started to fall in place for the South African Police Department. So let's backtrack a bit. Remember I said that when Sandile showed the police officers that there was just scorched earth and there was no actual body, apparently because Karabo's body had now been laid in a specific area, that was an area for another jurisdiction of police. So that was the Bramley's or Bramley's Police Department's responsibility. So remember, Sandile lived in the Santon area. And because he went to that particular police department, they have different jurisdictions in different areas. So because Caraba's body was found in Bramley, those were the police officers that found her body. Because people walking past thought that it was a burning mannequin. And they called the police to let them know. And police went out to have a look. And unfortunately, they found that it was a body. So they then took the body and they put it in their morgue to be investigated. And that's where this body was staying. So when the Santon police were looking into this case, basically they heard rumours that there was a Jane Doe that was at the Bromley police station or morgue area, and now they went over to have a look. Then the police of Bromley and Santon put two and two together, and they then asked for this Jane Doe to now go for a DNA test to find out who she was. Then a couple of days later, the DNA test came back, and unfortunately it was the DNA of Caraba McKenna. So now that the police had evidence of who the body actually belonged to, they went back to the Santon apartments and they knocked on Sandile's door, and as soon as Sandile opened, he was like, no, 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 it wasn't me, deny, deny, deny. And Caraba was then pulled back into the police station, and he said now that he was at the police station, that all the police were lying, and that he was forced to confess and that he just felt that he needed to because otherwise people already knew what he had done to Carabo in the beginning. So because what he had done to Carabo in the past, he thought, oh no, he had to do this because otherwise people would believe that he had now done everything, which he said that he didn't, he just found her body. Then Sandile started changing his tune again and he said that Carabo was lying on the bed and she just happened to sacrifice herself for him as part of the black magic that she believed in. Because apparently Sandile said that Caraba was obsessed with black magic and that because she felt so hurt in the relationship and that because nothing was happening, nothing was improving, that Caraba felt that she needed to sacrifice her life in order for the relationship to work. Or for Sandile to be free of the horrible tension and demons that were in this relationship. And some police officers in the Bromley police station actually believed that there was a hint of black magic in this whole case because they said that when they found Carabo's body that she was missing a lot of her organs, but the actual cause of death was never confirmed, so we don't know what actually happened to Carabo's body, but she is obviously deceased. But in general, most police didn't believe the black magic story. They said that it was completely Sandile, he was acting so sketchy, and they just wanted to arrest him. So police did end up arresting Sandile for the murder of Carabo McKenna, and he now had to stand trial. But before we head to the trial, I do just want to show you some footage that was believed to be the last known footage of Carabo alive. In the next bit of footage, you'll see that Sandile leaves the flat from the elevator. He then leaves the building, but he's now in a change of clothes. Now, Sandile did end up confessing that he did murder Carabo, but within the whole trial, he was completely victim shaming. Sandile said that Carabo liked money, she had many partners, she was mentally unstable because she was scarred from what her previous partners had done to her, and that she was getting money from them every single month. And that's all that Sandile could say about Carabo. They lived together, they dated each other, they were in love with each other, and all he could say were these horrible things about her. He had shown no remorse within this entire trial. He was giggling at some stages and he just didn't seem like he didn't want to be there at all. That this was a waste of his time. He could be out there spending money, gaining money and gaining followers. And throughout the trial, he was just constantly throwing shade at someone who was not there to defend themselves. As for Sandile's sentencing, this is what the judge had to say. In sentencing you, the intention is not only to punish you for what you had done, but also to serve as a warning to others that this type of conduct, and I'm stressing abuse, abuse of conduct toward women, 
will not be tolerated in our society. As far as the interest of society is concerned, no sentence that the court will impose today will bring back the deceased to life. She is now gone forever, thanks to you. A memory will still live on, however. Yes. Uh, you've shown no remorse at all. Even in evidence today, you've tried to avoid responsibility. You deserve nothing, nothing less than a harsh punishment. No other sentence than imprisonment would be appropriate. You caused an imbalance in the scale of justice, and that imbalance must now be corrected by imposing an appropriate sentence. To take a life comes at a high price. The court is of the opinion that the following would be an appropriate sentence. For the assault charge, you are sentenced to five years imprisonment. For murder, you are sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. <laughs> For the attempt to defeat or obstruct the course of justice, you are sentenced to four years in prison. In the interest of mercy, the court orders that two years of the five years on count one and four years on count three run concurrently with a sentence on count two. The effective sentence is therefore 32 years. Now, like I said earlier, sadly, the type of case of Karaba McKenna is not the first type that we have in South Africa, and it sadly won't be the last. This was a completely tragic case, and the horror that Karaba must have gone through is horrific to think about. It is also unimaginable. But that being said, I'm just going to end off with a more lighter note, and I hope that you are staying safe. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening this far in the case, and I hope you have a great day further. Bye.